This week on Disaffected, the biggest legislative Trojan horse in recent history has just passed the U.S. House of Representatives. We're going to dissect the Equality Act, which would force businesses to let men who claim they're women into female-only spaces. The bill puts girls and women at risk of encountering boys and men in school locker rooms, mall bathrooms, rape and domestic violence shelters, and more. Next, the Biden administration has nominated a transgender woman for assistant health secretary who thinks it's A-OK -okay to give minors puberty blockers and sometimes sex change surgeries. We'll watch the nominee refuse to answer Senator Rand Paul's question. Do you support legal genital mutilation of minors? Then we're gonna come back to the topic of the wounded bird camouflage. Psychology researchers are confirming what many of us have figured out. The people who frequently claim to be victims aren't just crying wolf. They're also likely to score high on tests for pathological narcissism and psychopathy. All that and more this week on Disaffected. Affected. I'm Joshua Sloka. This is the show where we talk about how personality disorders and personality disorder traits, abuse dynamics that we usually think about in context of the family and, and domestic violence and child abuse have spilled out into the public discourse and are starting to shape our public policy most acutely now on what I call the social justice left. Going to talk about something really important today. Uh, there's a bill that just passed the House of Representatives in the U.S. called the Equality Act, which is going to have very serious consequences for women's and girls' rights because it adds in the concept of gender identity and makes it equivalent to sex and appears to be uh, poised to make it illegal to have separate bathrooms that are women only, separate rape shelters, separate domestic violence shelters. And we'll get into that in the second segment. But first, um, I want to do a bit of housekeeping, and I want to tell you about a study I found that relates to something we talked about in a previous episode. So I made a mistake in the last episode when I talked about the two types of transsexuals in the theory, the homosexual transsexual and the autogynophile, and autogynophilia being um, the condition of having um, getting erotic, sat erotic satisfaction from seeing yourself as a woman. So these are the two types of of transsexuals, the effeminate homosexual, transsexual, and the autogynophile, which is usually um, a heterosexual male, and in fact seems to be the larger category of self-declared trans women today. The mistake I made was in the researcher's name. The researcher who came up with this typology, his name is Ray Blanchard. I knew that, but the wrong name flew out of my mouth, and by the time I remembered that I'd said the wrong thing, we'd already gotten the show out to you. So Ray Blanchard was the right answer. So I talked in a prior episode about something that I call the wounded bird camouflage, and that is when somebody makes themselves appear to be a victim of abuse or makes themselves appear to be especially fragile um, so that they can actually manipulate and abuse other people but not be seen as the aggressor. And there's actually some literature that supports that. This was published in July of 2020. It's an article based on some studies in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology. I'm just going to read the abstract to you. And I'll skip over some of it that, that's just technical language. We investigate the consequences and predictors of emitting signals of vict victimhood and virtue. In our first three studies, we show that the virtuous victim signal can facilitate non-reciprocal resource transfer from others to the signaler. Put in plain language, that means that somebody who says, help, help, I've been oppressed, help, I've been oppressed, they're usually able to extract money or social credit from other people because people think that they're in need. Next, we develop and validate a victim signaling scale that we combine with an established measure of virtue signaling to operationalize the virtuous victim construct. We show that individuals with dark triad traits, Machiavellianism, narcissism, psychopathy, more frequently signal virtuous victimhood, controlling for demographics and variables. So what they're saying here is that people who score high on narcissism, 
psychopathic traits and Machiavellianism, which is the willingness to ruthlessly exploit other people, are found to more frequently claim to be victims um, and claim to be especially virtuous people who are being mistreated and who therefore need special consideration and kindness. In study five, we show that a specific dimension of Machiavellianism, amoral manipulation, and a form of narcissism that reflects a person's belief in their superior prosociality predicts more frequent virtuous victim signaling. So those people who are willing to exploit other people and manipulate them without regard to the effect on that person um, also are more likely to believe that they are more socially virtuous or to claim that they believe they're more socially virtuous, and they more frequently claim to be a victim so that they can get and yes, queen. Because that's how victims get paid today in social currency. Studies three, four, and six test our hypothesis that the frequency of emerging, excuse me, emitting virtuous victim signals predicts a person's willingness, listen to this, to engage in ethically questionable behavior such as lying to earn a bonus, the intention to purchase counterfeit products, and moral judgments of counterfeiters. Isn't that fascinating? These people are not only likely, more likely to buy counterfeit products, but they're more likely to act in public as if they think that counterfeiters are terrible people. You, you see how they do this stuff? Uh, lying to uh, earn a bonus, counterfeit products, and making exaggerated claims about being harmed in an organizational context. Now, where have we heard that before? If you've been paying attention to any of the shenanigans going on at the New York Times, you know, uh, and we discussed this a couple episodes ago, that a reporter named Don McNeil, after more than 40 years with the Times, was fired for having uttered the N-word in a discussion with students about uh, racist language. And yet Nicole Hannah-Jones, who came up with the ahistorical 1619 project, um, seems to be able to say that word whenever she wants without any consequences. And, of course, Nicole Hannah-Jones and some of her other colleagues, like Taylor Lorenz at The New York Times, are constantly claiming to be victimized and oppressed by other people or the subject of verbal violence, when, in fact, I would say that they are amorally manipulating other people and putting out virtuous victim signals to distract you from it. So I thought it was a good way to start off the show to say that you know, if you've noticed this kind of behavior in people, you're not the only one who's noticed it. And psychologists are starting to see it now as well. Um, food for thought. We're going to take a quick break and then we're going to get into the longer segment about, a segment about the Equality Act. So be sure to come back. Welcome back. In this segment of the show, we're going to we are going to talk about the Equality Act, uh, which is a piece of legislation that uh, has just passed the U.S. House of Representatives. Uh, but but first, I need to give you a little funny break. I don't know about you all, but I waffle back and forth between thinking that we are hitting peak ridiculousness with the social justice left. But every time I think we get to a peak, I look up and there's another one even higher. So I was on Twitter yesterday. And I saw this. <laughs> Thank you, Oreo cookie. Trans people exist. And the best response, of course, there were thousands of them. And I'm delighted to say that most people were sort of shaking their head in, in frustrated pity. But the best response was, Oreo, you're a cookie. <laughs> This is another example of this, everybody. You know, trans people exist. Who says they didn't? Mm. So let's talk about trans people in the context of the Equality Act. So I'm guessing that most of the people who listen to this podcast or watch it are Americans, but there will be some of you who aren't. Thank you, international viewers and listeners. So in the United States... Um, when something is going to become federal law, it goes through a process and it has to go through our two chambers. So we have the House of Representatives, um, 
And that's the first chamber that um, has to debate, propose bills. Well, I think they can originate in the Senate, too. Um, And after the House has had a vote on a piece of legislation, it then goes over to the Senate. And our Senate is is much smaller. I think there are, what is it, 435 in the House of Representatives and one senator for, for every U.S. state. So the idea behind the Senate is that it's supposed to be a little bit more um, of a sober, refined, and serious body that can act as a check on the madnesses and passions that come up uh, in the House of Representatives, which is, I guess, sort of roughly analogous to the U.K.'s House of Commons. So this week, the, the Equality Act passed the House of Representatives despite protests from feminist organizations, and some other people who realize what the dangers are here. And the Equality Act, it, it drives me crazy. I mean, this is how legislation is done, of course, and and I'm sure it's probably the same in other Western countries. They put a name on it that you can't argue with. Who's against equality, right? I mean, this is why Black Lives Matters, which is a blatantly Marxist organization, calls itself Black Lives Matter. Because if you disagree with them, the first thought that comes into people's minds is, don't you think black lives matter? Don't black lives matter to you? I mean, yes, this this is babyish. But we're supposed to be adults who can see through the packaging, the brand name packaging on a product. But we, you know, humans do make decisions based on these emotional cues. I mean, this is this is Edward Bernays, the original father of, of advertising and advertising theory. I mean, this is what this is. It's um, what is his name? Uh, The guy who came up with uh, Don't Think of an Elephant, George, who's a Republican consultant. I'm going to remember at some point. You all will know who it is. Um, So let's let's look at the Equality Act. Very long piece of legislation. Not going to give you all of it, but I picked out seven or eight portions to go over. So let's talk first about the definitions. Actually, first I'm going to say this. I work for a nonprofit consumer organization, and I've worked there for 18 years. And a large part of my job during those 18 years has been reading, critiquing, um, marking up legislation, and sometimes drafting legislation. I've participated in drafting legislation that became law in several U.S. states. Um, My organization is frequently consulted. Uh, when there is state or federal legislation that would have an impact on consumers, and they ask for our point of view. So I'm very familiar with how legislation is written. I know good legislation, I know bad legislation, and I understand clear legislation. So this is a little mini lesson in statutory construction for you, how laws work and, and what elements they need to have to make sense as a law to be understandable and to be enforceable. This is one of the worst I've seen. I I honestly had a, a hard time believing that this actually was proposed, let alone passed, because it doesn't meet even the basic tests of a coherent piece of legislation. And the problems start in the definitions. Every piece of legislation has a section in the beginning, usually in the beginning, called definitions, where they actually define the terms. And this is important because legislation is supposed to be specific and it needs to be unambiguous and clear. So if you're writing legislation about auto safety, for example, yeah, you have to stop it and, and define things like the word car or automobile. You have to be very clear that automobile means this, but it doesn't mean a three-wheel off-road vehicle, even for basic stuff. So what do the definitions say in the Equality Act? The, the major changes to our law that the Equality Act would make have to do with inserting new concepts into already existing legislation. So we already have a federal civil rights law. This act would add two concepts to the concepts that already exist, and those are gender identity and sexual orientation. These are going to be added along to the categories of race and sex that already exist in the law. And gender identity, for those of you uh, who haven't listened to prior episodes, is the idea that regardless of the physical sex of a person, male or female, and of course in in a very, very tiny fraction of people, disorders of sexual development, which you might know as intersex or even more um, in the vernacular, what people used to call hermaphrodites. Important thing to know here, 
people with uh, disorders of sexual development or intersex people, these people may have ambiguous genitalia. They may have chromosomal anomalies that don't line up with the ordinary XX and XY split. But every one of these people can eventually be classified down to male or female, even if they have ambiguous genitalia. So it's a myth. There's no actual, th- there's no such thing as a hermaphrodite. There, there's never been any recorded case that I know of, um, of somebody who had a fully functional penis and testicles and a fully functional vagina and uterus. That's, that's a myth. If you believe that that's real, that isn't real and it's never been real, Okay. So gender identity is the idea that regardless of what your physical sex is, that you have an inner essence that is essentially male or essentially female or essentially masculine or essentially feminine. No, it doesn't make a lot of sense. And the the way I describe it is a gendered soul, right? And of course, people object to this and they say, oh, no, we're not talking about souls. This is science. Oh, no, excuse me. This is the science, you know, the same the science that tells us that we have to walk around with face diapers on uh, everywhere and, and people are really becoming accustomed to this madness. So the science, these people claim, says that we all have a gender identity, an internal sense of whether we're a man or a woman. And allegedly, people who say that they are trans or transgender have a gender identity that conflicts with their actual sex. But of course, it's not their actual sex with the left these days. It's their sex assigned at birth. <laughs> this is a this is actually a co-optation of terminology that's used with intersex people, uh, people with disorders of, of sexual development. There are times when there is so much ambiguity in the way the physical body manifests at birth that uh, particularly in the past, doctors have sort of assigned a sex uh, when it was indeterminate or couldn't be uh, determined originally. And that's led to problems. It used to be very common um, for intersex infants to be, quote, assigned a sex one or the other and then to have their their genitals surgically corrected, as they say. Um, the feeling now, and and I don't know as much about this as I could, but I, I'm inclined to agree with this. The feeling now is that that sort of thing shouldn't be done, that the, the child should be allowed to grow up and, and see how development makes things turn out uh, before they have um, so-called corrective and potentially mutilating surgery on their genitals. So gender identity. Let's get the definition from the Equality Act uh, and... Um, I think some of you are going to get what's wrong with this. Gender identity. The term gender identity means the gender-related identity, appearance, mannerisms, or other gender-related characteristics of an individual, regardless of the individual's designated sex at birth. (laughs) This is like defining water as... Water is um, a form of matter with water-like properties, generally described as a liquid. (laughs) Gender identity means the gender-related identity. This is what's known as a tautology or it's circular reasoning. This is not a definition. This is a definition that simply repeats the same word. In order to actually define a word, you have to make reference to other concepts. We reason by analogy, right? So when you open the dictionary and you look up the definition of the word lucid, for example, you're not going to find an entry in Merriam-Webster that says lucid, um, having the quality of lucidity. But that's exactly what this does right? The definition of lucid would be something like um, having the quality of being clear uh, related to the idea that uh, something that is transparent or that has a great deal of light on it is easier to see. It would be a definition something like that, but it wouldn't be lucid, the quality of having lucidity. But this is gender, having the quality of being related to gender-related things. The term gender identity means the gender-related identity, appearance, mannerisms, or other gender-related characteristics. This tells us nothing. I mean, 
Seriously, there's bad legislation all the time, but I've read a lot of legislation. I've done it for, no, I've done it for longer than 18 years because before I worked for this nonprofit, I was a newspaper reporter and I had to read and critique legislation and try to tease out meanings from that. I've never seen such a blatant example of circular reasoning before. This is not a mistake either. This is one of those cases where you will call it my cynicism, some of you, but I call it realism. This ambiguity and confusion is on purpose. Because the people reading or the people drafting this stuff, they know. Even if it's not all the way up here, maybe it's buried down here. They know this is nonsense. They know that this is Tinkerbell ontology. Remember how I talked about Tinkerbell ontology? When you have to (laughs) clap and say you do believe in fairies because that's the only way that Tinkerbell will survive? Well, that's what a lot of people who advocate for what they call transgender rights are doing, you know. You have to validate me, validate me. Trans is real. I'm valid. I exist. Nobody's saying you don't exist. What we're saying is we don't believe that there's a special, magical, invisible, immaterial thing inside of you that makes you a woman when you have a penis and testicles. I don't know what else to say. Well, let's get to the next definition. Sex. (laughs) I swear to God, this is like reading something out of Romper Room. The term sex includes A, a sex stereotype, pregnancy, childbirth, or a related medical condition, sexual orientation or gender identity, and sex characteristics including intersex traits. Buscuse me? Sex includes a sex stereotype, pregnancy, childbirth, or a related medical... So sex, sex means pregnancy... Sex means childbirth. Sex means a related medical condition. Sex means sexual orientation. So when I say the word sex, I mean gay, lesbian, bisexual, or straight. Sex includes gender identity. Sex includes characteristics and intersex traits. This is even worse than the first one. This is flat out incorrect. That doesn't mean anything because it means everything, right? We're just in the definition section, folks. We haven't even gotten to the meat of the legislation. That's how bad this is. And it passed the House. I'll bet you that no more than a handful of representatives, no more than a handful of the 435 people actually read this bill cover to cover. I did. Next section. Oh, there's a very long preamble in this bill. Um, it's like a lifetime television movie. Uh, overdramatized language talking about how people suffer discrimination in housing, in credit applications, in automobile loans, in accessing services. And it is true, historically, that, there. well, it, it used to be perfectly legal, legal in the United States to discriminate based on race and sex, you know? It was not until sometime in the 1970s that women were able to get credit cards and mortgages without having their husband's permission, uh, signature permission. And of course, all of us in the United States and most people in the Western world know what it was like when we had racial segregation, fountains for colored people, as we called them then, uh, separate but equal schools. These are real things, right? And these things are, for many people in this country, they are within living memory, right? This is not the past for a lot of people. They were alive for this. So we're very sensitive, rightly, to these things because we have a history of immoral discriminatory behavior. But you have to read this stuff carefully and you have to say, is this really the same thing? So this preamble goes on for page after page after page, and I'm going to tell you some of it. I mean, some of it is just head scratching. So part of the preamble. The discredited practice known as conversion therapy is a form of discrimination that harms LGBTQ people by undermining individuals' sense of self-worth, increasing suicide ideation and substance substance abuse, exacerbating family conflict, and contributing to second-class status. Conversion therapy, when people talk about that, they're usually thinking of some allegedly therapeutic practices that are going to turn gay people into straight people. And some of these were quite barbaric. Some of them involved 
um, aversion techniques whereby um, gay men, for example, would be shown images of, of, of homoerotic or, or gay pornography, and then something was done to them to, uh, to sort of condition them to have an averse response to that, a disgust response, you know, maybe electric shocks, maybe something else. Obviously, this kind of thing is barbaric and, and it's torture. But there's no nuance here. Let me blow your socks off. I'm a gay man. I don't believe anybody should be psychologically tormented for their sexuality. But I also believe that adult human beings should have the right to explore therapeutic options if they want to, whether or not I approve of them. If a gay person says, I don't want to be gay, or I want to explore whether or not I can gain heterosexual attraction, why are we standing in the way of that person in talk therapy? Conversion therapy here is so broad-based that it has been taken to mean that any, thera any therapy, even simply reflective psychodynamic talk therapy where you explore issues, anything that does not affirm somebody's so-called gender identity or sexual orientation is considered to be conversion therapy and therefore abusive. I talk about this stuff with my, with my shrink, who I just uh, used the initial J for. We talk about where sexuality comes from, homosexuality and heterosexuality. My therapist, and he shocked me when he said this to me first, but I've done some reading and I've come around. He said, I've worked with people who have wanted to change their erotic inclinations. I don't tell people they should do that. I don't tell anyone what they should do. I'm here to facilitate exploration for people so that they can they can find a way to heal on their own. And he's not saying you have to heal from gayness. He's never tried to tell me I shouldn't be gay. But he would be prohibited from discussing having this kind of conversation with his conversion therapy ban. This is not just what it appears on the surface. And if you're having a hard time with this, I understand because it, it may be the first time as I talk to you that you've heard someone, especially a gay person, say anything with regard to conversion therapy that wasn't utter horror. But again, I'm going to state this very plainly. Do we really think it is appropriate for the law to tell psychotherapists that they cannot talk about these topics with clients? That's a lot farther than saying you can't torture someone in, in, you know, in order to make them not gay. Oh, this is a good one. Again, and I should have said it. Grab a pen and paper. This is something you're going to want to take notes on. This is an opportunity to introduce you to a very important concept. I'm going to read it to you. Both LGBTQ people and women face widespread discrimination in employment and various services, including by entities that receive federal financial assistance. First of all, I object to LGBTQ. There's no such thing as an LGBTQ person. There's nobody who is both lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer. And who the hell knows what queer means? Nobody knows what it means. In practice, it seems to indicate people who, um, well, exhibit traits of... Anyone who's got a lot of metal in their face, anyone who says... I'm polyamorous or I'm demi-romantic or any of this bullshit nonsense that young people are coming up with now. Apparently, that's what queer means. There's no such thing as an LGBTQ person. I'm not an LGBTQ person. I'm a gay man. I'm a homosexual. And I do not share a demographic community with people who dye their hair blue and throw tantrums when I don't call them they. I have nothing in common with these people. I live in the real world. And there are a hell of a lot of gays and lesbians and bisexuals out there who feel this way too, but are afraid to say it. But what happened here is a concept I want you to remember and, and write this down if you're taking notes. This is called forced teaming. Forced teaming, like putting people on a team together. This is a concept that comes from uh, somebody named Gavin De Becker. Gavin De Becker. I highly recommend his book, The Gift of Fear. Gavin DeBecker is now a consultant and a security expert. He runs a, a very, um, very high-level security firm for public figures and celebrities. He keeps them safe from stalkers. Gavin DeBecker came from an extraordinarily abusive childhood um, with a mother who was hooked on drugs, 
um, who shot and killed her husband, and I think his father was also abusive. Um, I came from a, a really horrendous childhood as well, but Gavin De Becker's outstrips mine. And he is absolutely a master at explaining to people the linguistic manipulations that people use in order that narcissists use, narcissists and psychopaths particularly, but personality disorder people use to lower your guard. Forced teaming is what they're doing when they say both LGBTQ people and women face widespread discrimination. They're putting LGBTQ people and women next to each other to say, hey, we're all in this together, just like women were oppressed in this way. The sexist oppression that women face, to whatever degree you believe that they face it, is not necessarily the same thing as the kinds of oppressions that lesbians, gays, bisexuals, trans, etc. experience. This is important because the Equality Act is actually stripping women's rights away, and they want you to think that it isn't by forced teaming, okay? They want you to think these people are all in there together. They're not, because some of the so-called rights that the trans activists are demanding are in direct contradiction to rights that women have. This bill, and, and we'll get to it, I'm going to show you the proof here, is going to take away the right of businesses to have sex-segregated bathrooms. It's going to take away the right of high school girls to have locker rooms that are free of, of boys. <sighs> Creepy. This is a Trojan horse, folks. This is a Trojan horse. The next section. As a result of the absence of explicit prohibitions against discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity, credit applicants who are LGBTQ or who are perceived to be LGBTQ have unequal opportunities to establish credit. LGBTQ people can experience being denied a mortgage, credit card, student loan, or many other types of credit simply because of their sexual orientation or gender identity. Nonsense. I don't believe that. I don't believe it. I have a mortgage. I have two mortgages, actually. I have three credit cards. I have a Toyota Prius that I have two to three years left to pay on. Nowhere when I applied for these lines of credit did anyone ask me who I slept with. Nobody asked me if my internal sense of a man was strong or if I felt that I was a lady inside. Nobody asked me if I was transgender. What they asked me about were things that are germane to whether or not they're going to give me a loan for $25,000. How much money do you make and can you show it on a pay stub? Can you show it on a tax return? I'm sure that there are isolated instances where people are discriminated against for these things. But I struggle to believe that Visa, MasterCard, my credit union, Toyota Financial Services, or any of these other lenders give a shit about whether my sense of myself as a man matches what's on the outside. This is ludicrous, and I don't believe it. Here's where we get into the real serious meat of this. <clears throat> this bill applies to any establishment that provides a good service or program, including a store, shopping center, online retailer or service provider, salon, bank, gas station, food bank, service or care center, shelter, travel agency or funeral parlor or establishment that provides health care, accounting, or legal services. And I added the emphasis on the word shelter here. Do you know what this means? It's illegal to discriminate against a man, an actual man, who goes to a women's shelter for domestic violence or a women's refuge, a rape crisis refuge. If he asserts that his gender identity is female, that constitutes illegal discrimination for that shelter to turn him away. Yes. This is what's going on, people. Some of you listening right now have had violent childhoods like I did. My mother was beat up mercilessly by my stepfather. One night he tried to kill her. 
women like my mother have fled households like this to women's shelters to get away from men. This bill is going to take that away. What is wrong with people who are voting for this? There's nothing in this bill that establishes how you can tell that someone is making a factual assertion about their gender identity. How could you? Some guy walks up to you and says, I'm a woman, and that's it? He's a woman? He's into the rape shelter? And when you bring this up to liberals, they say, oh, that sounds just like scare tactics. That's exactly the same thing that they said about gay people. Gay people shouldn't be allowed to be in public schools because they'll molest children. Bullshit. It is not the same thing. That, that idea that, that homosexuality means pedophilia, that's actually false. Verifiably false. It's not analogous here. People have no trouble, even the lefties, who, who, who faint and scream and emote and call me a bigot when I talk about this problem here. Even they understand this phenomenon. Think of the Catholic Church. So people will say, what man would go to all the trouble of claiming to be a woman just so that he could get into the women's locker room or just so that he could have access to girl children? You don't have any trouble, trouble understanding why a predator would go all the way through seminary and become ordained as a priest to have access to children, do you? No, you don't. You all recognize it. And suddenly you think that these guys, these narcissists, these psychopaths, these sexual predators aren't going to go to the trouble of a certain... What trouble? What trouble? How much trouble is it to say, I'm a woman and this is my firmly held declaration. I am a lady. Therefore, under the law now, under the, Qual the Equality Act, you have to let me in. There's not even any hoops to jump through. At least the guys in the priesthood actually had to go through cemetery, seminary, cemetery. <laughs> I, I, it is, it's just, oh, it's astonishing to me. And I don't even know how we're going to get, we're getting to the end of this soon. Um, this is just a sample. This is, this is, I'm not even reading the whole legislation to you. I don't quite know how to interpret this. Inserting the clause enterprise if in a situation in which sex is a bona fide occupational qualification, individuals are recognized as qualified in accordance with their gender identity. I'm not quite sure what this means, but it looks to me like they are getting rid of legitimate exemptions from this. Where, Say, for example say that a women's shelter, and this is, a, it's not a universal, but it's a very common practice. Most women's shelters, refuges from rape and domestic violence, will only have women as staff and counselors. Why? Well, because statistically it's men who do most of the raping and battering. That's just a fact. Fact. That's male typical behavior. It's not female typical behavior. And the women who are coming out of abusive marriages or uh, abusive relationships with men not only have a reasonable expectation of being able to have some privacy as they try to recover and put their lives back together away from men, but they're very often legitimately emotionally triggered by men in their proximity as a trauma reaction, right? So is this saying that Somebody who asserts that their gender identity is female must therefore be considered to have the female sex. It's unclear, but I suspect that's what this means. But notice also what happened here. <clears throat> Excuse me. They, they mash these two concepts together again. Enterprise, if in a situation in which sex, sex, is a bona fide occupational qualification. Individuals are recognized as qualified in accordance with their gender identity. So again, gender identity and sex are supposed to be the same thing. This is language manipulation. It is gaslighting. It is designed to confuse you because a lot of you, a lot of people out in the public, don't believe that somebody could have as much evil intent as this legislation indicates. They do. 
they do have that much evil intent. And there are many people who are advocating for this who are not evil, who really believe that this is just helping those poor, extremely effeminate gay men who transition to become women who would never hurt a fly. It's not true. This is going to literally, legally, open the door to men in female bathrooms. I mean, if I'm reading this bill correctly, stores, Target will no longer be able to have change rooms that are for women only. So if you want to bring your daughter in there for her first bra fitting, better get ready to have Eddie next door in there. Hello, I'm Linda. It's already happened in England. Don't tell me this never happens. If you're sitting there saying this never happens, stop it. What You want this never to have happened, but it has happened. There's actually a group on Facebook called This Never Happens that has thousands, thousands of entries from the UK, the United States, and other countries that has shown this happening. It's already happened several times in the UK. And it's made the major newspapers. One girl got molested by a guy who claimed he was a, a woman, a transgender woman, um, because the stores weren't keeping men out of the women's bathrooms. So what about public schools? What about girls' sports? This is a nightmare. <laughs> Here, here's the last one. If you don't believe me, you think I'm exaggerating, that I'm making this up, that I'm one of those terrible discriminatory people. Let me give it to you from the Trojan horse's mouth. With respect to gender identity, an individual shall not be denied access to a shared facility, including a restroom, a locker room, and a dressing room that is in accordance with the individual's gender identity. This is what you voted for with Joe Biden. This is what you voted for by voting Democrat. Donald Trump's administration, stop this bullshit and said, sex means biological sex, gender means something else. And Joe Biden got in office and reversed his executive orders, and now they're gonna make it the law of the land. This just passed our House. It's been approved in the House. Now it goes over to the Senate. You happy with your choices? Come back for the next segment. Welcome back. I want to say a couple of things before um, I get into this video segment we're going to watch. Number one, I want to make it clear that I am for anti-discrimination laws, okay, including for trans people, including for people who are gay, obviously. There are some good portions of the Equality Act. It's perfectly appropriate to make it illegal to deny necessary services to people on the basis of sexual orientation, on the basis of their gender identity. I may not believe in gender identity, but people are allowed to express themselves the way they want. And that's as it should be. People are allowed to dress as they want. They are allowed to name themselves as they want. Um, and they should not be subject to violence. And they should not be subject to legal coercion or legal disenfranchisement uh, from the state. You know, to the extent that there's any of me left that's a liberal... I believe in these basic liberal ideas about human freedom. So the entire bill isn't terrible, but the devil really is in the details. And I also know, as pe people tell me this a lot, and, and some of you may be thinking of it, they say, these are the lunatic activists. This is not like the trans people I know. I know there are a lot of trans people out there who are not behind this nonsense, who are much more firmly grounded in reality. I recognize that's true. But it's immaterial right now because their voices aren't being heard. And it's not because of what I'm saying, and it's not because of what feminists are saying. We are not responsible for the fact that their voices aren't being heard. That's not our doing. These people need to speak up. If this does not represent you as a trans person, you need to speak up. Okay? Don't get angry at me. I don't want to do anything to thwart your life. No, I don't want you to be able to go into a women's locker room if you're a man. Yes, we may disagree on that, but I do not want you to be fired. I don't want you to be denied a job. I don't want you to be denied a student loan. I don't want you to be beat up or harassed. And if any of those things happen, I will sign the petition with you and for you. 
just like I always have, just like most decent people do. And I also want to say this show is not always going to be all about transgender issues. I've been going pretty hard on this for the past couple of episodes because it's important. It's in the news right now, and it's in the news in a consequential way. These laws that are being debated are going to have very serious effects on our society, not just for women, but primarily for women right now. This We have got to talk about this. But I also think, you, you know, my hypothesis, right? The origin of the show is that cluster B personality disorders and people who use personality disorder style abuse tactics and the dynamics, the relationship between the abuser and the abused and how abused people get conditioned into Stockholm syndrome and then get conditioned and co-opted into being flying monkeys and carrying out this abuse. The hypothesis behind this show is that this has exploded out of the domestic realm and into the public realm, and it's now controlling public policy. We are living in a cluster B world, and trans is the most Simon Pure example of cluster B capture right now. That's why I'm hitting it so hard. But I do want you to know that the show is not going to be about this all the time. But we got to talk about this. And we got to talk about something else in this vein, too, and this has to do with the idea of transgenderism in children. Joe Biden has nominated Dr. Rachel Levine to be the assistant health secretary. Dr. Levine is a transgender woman. And Dr. Levine believes that it is appropriate and healthful to give minor children cross-sex hormones. Remember, those poison you. If you're a man and you take Estrogen, that's poison to your body. If you're a woman and you take testosterone, that's poison to your body. It ends up, for women, often permanently masculinizing their voices, dropping them down so that it can never come back if you change your mind. Uh, Same thing with body hair. Um, Women who are on testosterone for a long time often have vaginal atrophy, which gets extremely painful. And these women, if they can orgasm at all, can only orgasm in extreme pain. Yeah. Yeah. I want to I'm going to play you four and a half minutes from the Senate with Senator Rand Paul questioning Rachel Levine. See what you think. Genital mutilation has been nearly universally condemned. Genital mutilation has been condemned by the WHO the United Nations Children's Fund, the United Nations Population Fund. According to the WHO, genital mutilation is recognized internationally as a violation of human rights. Genital mutilation is considered particularly egregious because, as the WHO notes, it is nearly always carried out on minors and is a violation of the rights of children. Most genital mutilation is not typically performed by force, but as WHO notes that by social convention, social norm, the social pressure to conform, to do what others do and have been doing, as well as the need to be accepted socially and the fear of being rejected by the community. American culture is now normalizing the idea that minors can be given hormones to prevent their biological development of their secondary sexual characteristics. Dr. Levine, you have supported both allowing minors to be given hormone blockers to prevent them from going through puberty, as well as surgical destruction of a minor's genitalia. Like surgical mutilation, hormonal interruption of puberty can permanently alter and prevent secondary sexual characteristics. The American College of Pediatricians reports that 80 to 95% of prepubertal children with gender dysphoria will experience resolution by late adolescence if not exposed to medical intervention and social affirmation. Dr. Levine, do you believe that minors are capable of making such a life-changing decision as changing one's sex? Well, Senator, thank you for your interest in this question. Um, Transgender medicine is a very complex and nuanced field um, with robust research and uh, standards of care that have been developed 
And if I am fortunate enough to be confirmed as the Assistant Secretary of Health, I will look forward to working with you and your office and coming to your office and discussing the particulars of the standards of care for transgender yeah, medicine. The specific question was about minors. Let's be a little more specific since you evaded the question. Do you support the government intervening to override the parent's consent to give a child puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones, and or amputation surgery of breasts and genitalia? You have said that you're willing to accelerate the protocols for street kids. I'm alarmed that poor kids with no parents who are homeless and distraught, you would just go through this and allow that to happen to a minor. I would hope that you would have compassion for Kira Bell, who's a 23-year-old girl who was confused with her identity. At 14, she read on the internet about something about transsexual. She thought, well, maybe that's what I am. She ended up getting these puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones. She had her breasts amputated. But here's what ultimately she says now. And this is a very insightful from decision from someone who made a mistake but was led to believe this was a good thing by the medical community. I made a brash decision as a teenager, as a lot of teenagers do, trying to find confidence and happiness, except now the rest of my life will be negatively affected, she said, adding that the medicalized gender transitioning was a very temporary, superficial fix for a very complex identity issue. What I'm alarmed at is that you're not willing to say absolutely minors shouldn't be making decisions to amputate their breast or to amputate their genitalia. For most of our history, we believe that minors don't have full rights and the parents need to be involved. So I'm alarmed that you won't say with certainty that minors should not have the ability to make the decision to take hormones that will affect them for the rest of their life. Will you make a more firm decision on whether or not minors should be involved in these decisions? Senator, uh, transgender medicine is a very complex and nuanced field. Uh, and if confirmed to the position of Assistant Secretary of Health, I would certainly be pleased to come to your office and talk with you and your staff about the standards of care and the complexity of this field. Let it go into the record that the witness refused to answer the question. The question is a very specific one. Should minors be making these momentous decisions? For most of the history of medicine, we wouldn't let you have a cut sewn up in the ER. But you're willing to let a minor take things that prevent their puberty, and you think they get that back? Did you see it? This is a really consequential question. Do you think it's appropriate for children's genitals to be mutilated? Well, transgender medicine is very nuanced. He repeated it twice. We are expected to accept that. Well, let me back up. We, we are accepted to accept a man like this as our assistant health secretary who will not say that there's something wrong with poisoning children with cross-sex hormones and permanently taking away their fertility and altering their bodies. And we're expected to take this, we're expected to, we're expected to call Rachel Levine a woman. I'm sorry, but this is, this is a clown world. This guy looks like one of those character actors who played walk-on roles on sitcoms like Bewitched. I mean, I expect he's like one of those guys at McMahon and Tate and, and Dora was, you know, invisibly sitting up there in the corner and then went. Brrrr. I mean, it, it's absurd. This is absurd. And the vocal affectations. The artificially high voice, it's called voice feminization. It's a technique you learn from a vocal coach. He sounds like Jack Lemon in someone, Some Like This Hot, Some Like It Hot. Be, and you know why? Because that's what he is. This, is. this is a farce. This is a comedic farce. I wouldn't have to make fun of this if we weren't expected to take it so goddamn seriously. Some of you have heard of female genital mutilation. This is a practice that is found in some parts of Africa and some parts of the Islamic world. And it can range from small cuts 
to clitoridectomy, that is slicing the clitoris off, slicing off the organ that gives females sexual pleasure. And the worst form of this, this is disgusting and, and I you need to brace for it, but you need to hear it. The worst form is called infibulation. And that is when not only the clitoris is removed, but the vagina is abraded and then sewn up crudely into a very, leaving only a teeny, tiny little opening. It's, it's, it's insanity. We recognize female genital mutilation as a scourge on girls and women. What makes it okay to amputate a young woman's breasts? To consider having your child, your male child, have his testicles removed? Why is it so easy to see how evil this is when it's called female genital mutilation, but not to see how evil it is when it's called gender confirmation surgery or gender affirming care? These euphemisms are evil. There's one place I differ with Rand Paul here or that I'd qualify. And, and many people use this terminology, and I don't think they understand the full implications of it. I don't think they're bad people. But did you hear him say, you know, do you want this to happen without parents' consent? I don't want it to happen with parents' consent, and nobody should want it to happen with parents' consent. This is not about parental consent. This turns, and this is very common with libertarians, and as, as you can guess, I have a lot of uh, sympathy with the libertarian perspective. I don't call myself a libertarian or a liberal or a conservative, but I certainly have a wide libertarian streak. I think the closest thing I'd be comfortable calling myself would be a classical liberal in the UK sense. Libertarians talk about parental rights a lot, and they need to reconsider that. Parents don't have rights. They have duties. Children have rights. You know the phrase, the international, I'm not going to get it right, the rights of the child? Parents do not have rights. Children are not property. Parents are the stewards and guardians and custodians of children. They have only duties. No rights, only duties. They have the right to make decisions about how to provide care for the child, but the rights are subordinate to the moral duty to protect the child. <sighs> what people think these so-called transgender kids are going through, they think that this is so, a new and unique kind of pain that's never been seen under the sun before, but it isn't. What we call gender dysphoria today, about eight years ago, used to be called gender identity disorder until another political decision to change that in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, which classifies alleged psychiatric disorders under the U.S. system and is mainly used for insurance billing purposes. If it's not the DSM, the insurance company is not going to reimburse the doctor or the psychiatrist. So they tried to split the baby Solomon style and, and keep gender dysphoria in instead of gender identity disorder because the term disorder is stigmatizing you know every time i every time i hear you know it's stigmatizing borderlines do this all the time oh we're so stigmatized people stigmatize us they think we're bad people it's terrible if they only understood we just feel more than other people oh shut up some things should be stigmatized. Some behavior should be stigmatized. This behavior should be stigmatized. When I was a kid, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my gender dysphoria. Another person that, if you're interested in this, that you might want to pay attention to is a writer uh, named Chad Felix Green. He writes for The Federalist, which is a conservative publication in the U.S. He's on Twitter. Uh, and he said similar. We're not, we don't have exactly the same views, but he's worth listening to for his perspective as well. What we call gender dysphoria today is experienced, I can't give you a number, but I, I'm pretty confident that it's most young boys who turn out to be gay. This idea that there's something wrong with your body because the way you feel and the way you behave is, is something only girls are supposed to do. So you must have been born a mistake. 
right? Let me let me give you a window into what I thought as a child. When I was five years old, all the way back to my first conscious memories, which started late age three, just before age four, I I always remember feeling as though I were different, that I wasn't like other boys. Um, and and with the perspective of adulthood, looking back now, um, I think it's it's fairly straightforward. Um, I was a sh- I, believe it or not, I was a shy kid. I was a shy and scared kid. I was very afraid, very high anxiety. That's stayed with me my entire life. Um, but I was bookish, and I was not. I, I'm clumsy. I've always been clumsy. I I can't. I drop dishes. I can't catch a ball. I can't throw very well. But I never really got a chance to develop any athleticism because I I was so scared of being inadequate in front of the other boys that I did everything I could to avoid it. I was the kid that got picked last uh, during PE class for the team. I was the target who always got the dodgeball hitting him in the face. I was that kid. But I, so I was afraid of other boys. I was afraid of them and I was ashamed that I didn't measure up to them. I liked girls. I wanted friends who were girls. I liked to talk. I liked to talk about feelings. I liked to create fantasy worlds fairy castles, witches, uh, haunted forests. Um, and I, I used to I used to dress up as a girl. Also very, very common for gay men when they're boys. And this drove my mother insane. Well, no, it didn't. My mother was already insane. <laughs> but as an example, I, I, I used to play by myself a lot. I mean, I had to. I, I had to find a place. I had to find a corner of, of quiet where I could play by myself. And I loved the show I Dream of Jeannie. Um, I just loved it. I, I, I just, it was magical. I don't know what it was. It's this ridiculous 60s sitcom. I liked Bewitched as well. Um, but I used to pretend that I was Jeannie. And I'd go in my bedroom and I'd rearrange my furniture so that it would be in a circle. Like, do you remember uh, In Her Bottle? You know, she had those circular couches and my grandmother would lend me her costume jewelry, this Avon stuff and Sarah Coventry. Do you remember that? <laughs> and I would do things. I would take her um, her costume pearl necklaces and I'd hang them up on the wall to look like the jewelry and the jewels embedded in the walls inside of Jeannie's bottle. And I also loved Little House on the Prairie. And my absolute favorite character was Nellie Olson. Because gay boys like mean girls. I don't know why, but they sure do. Uh, th- my mother hated that too. She she would say to me, what's wrong with you? You like that mean girl, Nellie Olson. What's wrong with you, Josh? When I was five years old, I wanted to be the Wicked Witch of the West for Halloween. And at this time, my mother had married my stepfather. My stepfather um, is the father of my younger brother and my younger sister. So we share a mother, but we don't share a father. He was very violent. But he took the right side on this one. My mother threw a fit when I told her I wanted to be the Wicked Witch. Boys can't be witches. Why are you even saying that? Boys are wizards. No, I'm not going to let you go out of the house dressed like a witch. God, what's wrong with you? She really got upset, really, really upset. And it scared me. I was five. I just wanted to be a witch for Halloween. And my stepfather, my mother was just getting to the point where she was chopping vegetables, slamming things down. Go out of this house dressed as a girl. My stepfather looked at her. He said, what's wrong with you? The kid just wants to dress up as a witch for Halloween. What is wrong with you? Just let him go as a witch. No. And later... These are samples, right? These are little vignettes. There were, this kind of stuff was constant in my childhood. And I quickly figured out, I thought, that I had been born bad. My first conscious memory <laughs> was my mother slapping me across the face and saying, Dirty. You are dirty. I was almost four years old, 
we lived in a trailer, a single wide trailer. Turquoise blue was built in the 1950s and it had a built in dinette, a little cubby hole with a round table. And my mother used to have girlfriends come over and drink coffee and smoke cigarettes and play cards. This is what you did before the internet, right? <laughs> um, and I was, I was almost four years old and I can tell you honestly, I, I, I know this is true. I, there are some memories that I'm, I'm not certain if they're something I've confabulated, but this happened. I don't know why I did what I did, but all I can remember is having a sense of curiosity. Um, my mom and her friend were playing cards at the table, and I crawled up under the table. I like to be with the adults and hear the adult conversation. And out of curiosity, I crawled up to my mother, and I crawled between her legs. And my head ended up hitting her groin in her pants. And she pushed me back and she slapped me across the face and she said, dirty. I don't remember anything after that. I thought I had been born evil. And I used to have conversations with God at night when I went to bed. I used to pray to God and ask him to make me a normal boy when I woke up the next morning. I had sinful thoughts, even as a young kid. I felt differently about boys than I knew I was supposed to. I can't say they were exactly sexual feelings at six or seven years old. I didn't, I can't really say it was sexual, um, but it was pre-sexual. Boys were scary to me, but they were intriguing and exciting in a way that girls weren't. Girls felt like friends. They felt like sisters to me. But I prayed, dear God, please, I don't want to think these things. I don't want to be this way. Please make me be a normal boy in the morning. And then other times I would say, I was a mistake. Something happened. I have a birth defect. I was supposed to be a girl. I just want to be good. I, I want to be good. And of course, my prayers weren't answered. But I genuinely thought that I was a mistake. I was an anomaly. I was supposed to be a girl and I'd come out in a boy's body. And that's why I dressed up this way. And that's why I acted like a sissy, because I was a girl. But if you were a boy who wanted to be a girl, you were dirty. That's gender dysphoria. What these kids are going through is not a new phenomenon. It's hard, but it's also not a new depthless kind of pain that no one else can fathom. And that is what has grabbed so many of us, so many people on the compassionate left have gone down the road of supporting trans, so-called transgender children because they think it's the same as protecting, frankly, a sweet sissy boy like I was. Those kids do need support and they do need help, but what they don't need is their heads fucked with. And it's fucking with a kid's head to tell him that because he wants long hair, or he wants to put on nail polish, or he wants to play with his grandmother's costume jewelry, that that means he's trans. I, I have very little doubt that if I had been born a couple decades later, I'd be castrated right now. There are some things about my family that I cannot share with you because they would intrude on the privacy of other members of my family, and it's not my place to tell their story. But I can tell you that I know what my mother would have done because there is a young person in the orbit of our family who believed he was a girl. And my mother fairly salivated at it. I remember walking into her living room one day when she was talking about it and she was putting on one of her histrionic displays. And she stood there and she looked at me with tears in her eyes running down her face. I always knew, I always knew there was a beautiful, pretty girl soul in there. It's sick. This is sick. I always seem to leave you on a, on a hard note, don't I? Well, these are hard times. Thanks for joining me. See you again next week. As always, thank you for listening or watching. And it's really important, please share and please subscribe. 
And in particular, I want to ask you to check us out on Rumble. There's no telling how long mainstream services like YouTube are going to let us stay up because our content is not to their liking. Check us out on Rumble. Check us out on Spotify, iTunes, or wherever you get your podcasts.